so just in case anyone, I know there are a couple of folks who may not know Hana, um, I just wanted to thank Hana for for leading our session this evening. Um, in case you don't know, Hana and Nate, who are logged on separately, um, they, not, I'm not going to say were, I'm going to say are amazing, wonderful members of our community um, who really do tremendous, tremendous things, um, both for the shul and for each other and for the world, as we will learn about. Um, they uh, moved to Ithaca as part of the pandemic life rearranging that many of us have experienced. Um, but though I guess the bizarreness of pandemic life is that, uh, yeah, it doesn't actually feel like that at all. <laughs> we still talk all the time. So, um, so thank you so very much. Ithaca is gorgeous. Thank you, Julia. We are gorgeous. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and she can tell us all about that. And so this is recording. And Hana is now the official Zoom host of the event. And I will let her take it away. All right. Great. Namhara Urth, thank you so much. That was such a sweet introduction. I was not expecting that. Um, so I, I played around with a few alternate names for this presentation. And one of the names I thought of was what I learned in Ithaca, <laughs> you know, kind of doing the Lethlica thing where we left our birthplace of Montgomery County and went to this strange, uh, not really exotic, but new place <laughs> to pursue something. So I'm just gonna, you know, go ahead and jump right in. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Fauna and I work in an energy efficiency nonprofit. So I do a lot of work with like, you know, allocation of resources and, you know, the research that's been happening in that area. Um, I'm also an aspiring farmer and we're gonna, you know, learn a little bit about how farming plays into the role of global systems and uh, production lines for things. So to you know, basic facts that be some good background. So um, I really, really enjoy the partio of Bayako and Pakude and Taruma and Satave unlike a lot of other people that <laughs> study Judaism because you get through all of these exciting stories and then you're just kind of seeing like, oh, this is an instruction book. We're talking about materials and measurements and all those fun things. So, you know, I like to frame them in a different context and kind of bring some new light to these partial. So we're gonna start actually at the very beginning. Um, we're going to start back in Bereshi. And so you have this clan of, you know, siblings and relatives, and they all come down to Egypt where their brother Yosef is now a ruler. And um, Paro asks Yosef's brothers, what is your occupation? And they answer to Paro, we, your servants, are shepherds, as were also our fathers. And so shepherds work really closely with nature. They observe the changing of the seasons, patterns of the land, they take a lot of care of their livestock. And um, another really important fact to remember is that they use every part of the sheep, including milk, wool, and eventually their meat and hides as well. Um, and this is actually very different from typical Egyptian city life. We haven't really gotten the post-industrial break from, you know, farming to city, but if you read some of the historical, you know, um, logs of Egyptian life in that time, you can actually see that they're beginning to have that division between the city life and the rural life, especially for the ruling class. Um, and so thinking about this, we can really see how Yosef's advice to Faro on saving grain for famine years brought him to a level of leadership and brought him to a place where, you know, he was a high official in that time. And so when we open up with the book of Shemot, they say, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Yosef. So he did not know Yosef, and he did not know the ways of Yosef. And he said to his people, look, the Israelite people are much too numerous for us. Let us deal shrewdly with them, so they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us and rise from the ground. And so they set up the system. They set up taskmasters to oppress them with forced labor. And they built the garrison cities for Paro, Kutom, and Ramses. So we can see kind of from the get-go that their social structure of the shepherd clan is being broken into parts. Um, so they're taken out of their element. And it's important to know that slavery is a form of displacement. It's a way to control people. Um, 
and oppressors need to essentially disintegrate their communal structures and cultural practices. So when people are slaves, the core focus becomes day-to-day -day survival. Um, some of the first activities that go are subsistence farming, reproductive labor in the home, such as like caring for children, repairing clothing and running a household, and all crafts that reflect a group's cultural identity. And so oftentimes this is um, a burden that's disproportionately placed on women who have had historically the roles of serving in a society, but also running a household. And so we can look at this in the frame of Magi when we retell our story of being in slavery. And they put hard work upon us, as it is said. The Egyptians made the children of Israel work with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard work, with mortar and with bricks, and all a manner of service in the field, all their work which they made, made them work with rigor. So oftentimes the question is asked, why the repetition? Um, and I'm going to use a simple explanation of the labor was really, really hard. <laughs> um, and so we can kind of see a hint, you know, reading through this this year, um, being surrounded by different agricultural areas, I kind of saw it from a different perspective. Um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and read through and then pause at the end. So the taskmasters and foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Paro, I will not give you any straw. You must go and get the straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but there shall be no decrease whatever in your work. Then the people scattered throughout the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the taskmaster pressed them saying, you must complete the same work assignment each day as when you had straw. And the foremen of the Israelites whom Paro's taskmasters had sent over them were beaten. Why, they asked, did you not complete the prescribed amount of bricks, either yesterday, today, as you did before? Again, with the moral degradation, they're really trying to you know, beat them down and um, make them feel like they're out of control of their situations. Mm -hmm. The foremen of the Israelites came to Paro and cried, why do you deal thus with your servants? No straw is issued to your servants, yet they demand of us, make bricks. Thus, thus your servants are being beaten when the fault is with your own people. Now, I, I really want to focus in on that line, when the fault is with your own people. So we see from this that it's not just that they're having this extra hard work, but there is literally no straw and no vegetation left for them to gather. Um, so they're kind of, I put some images of like desert landscapes and over farm landscapes. You have the sandy soil and hardly anything grows. And so when Yosef was telling Paro about his dreams, he was saying there'd be seven years of plentifulness and then seven years of famine. And if you recall what happened in the dreams, in the end, the skinny cows in the cow dream swallowed the fat cows and they all became skinny cows. And I'm like, hey, what, you know, Yosef's clearly giving him some advice. Why is it that the thin cows are swallowing the fat cows and it just ends there? Um, I think that this might be a hint that there's something more than just the seven years on and seven years off that's happening. This means that the new paro that arose over Egypt must have continued, you know, over farming and over exploiting the soil to the extent that nothing grew, that they couldn't even gather straw for bricks. And so we go to the future. <laughs> um, welcome to 2020, COVID happened. Um, as Maharat Ruth said, me and my spouse, Nate, decided to move to Ithaca, New York and start a farm and, you know, try and do that. So everyone's like, oh, why do you live in such a cold place? I do have to say we have the best farmer's market. Um, we had the world's biggest peace sign made by like people standing on the ground, lots of waterfalls in nature, and then like a high concentration of drum circles, <laughs> which is, you know, also a priority. Um, but it also is one of, you know, with climate change happening, uh, there is a lot of farming activity in the area. And, you know, as it keeps getting warmer, this farmland will still remain viable throughout the years. So this is us moving. Um, I would say we got rid of about 90% of our physical possessions. Uh, you can see us here in the car. Cats are in the backseat. Everything is stuffed. Um, 
It, we went through our apartment and I used to work in an office setting. I now work from home. We got rid of 19 bags of clothing. So just, you know, starting you in a new place. And so we came here and we were so excited. We were like, all right, we're gonna do this sustainable farming thing. It's gonna be great, good yields, production, organics, all that fun stuff. We're gonna harvest all of our crops and then we're gonna sell them at the market. And then, you know, once we sell them at the market, we're gonna donate the excess to, you know, local charities and things. We're gonna have chickens and the chickens will help, you know, maintain the natural balance of the ecosystems. And we're gonna use horses to till the fields and do some grain production, but reality struck. And by the time we got here, I would say the real estate market is really like either everyone's buying farms or there's just no houses that are livable that are out there for us to buy. So just a complete mess. Um, it felt like it was really out of control. No farm, six months later, we're still in our apartment, but I was like, okay, we need to focus on the things that we can control. So we started trying to do some low impact living, started shopping super locally, um, trying to get all our errands done in like one car trip, grouping those together. Um, we also got rid of a lot of our single use plastics. We started shopping in bulk. We started doing large pickups from farms. Um, we got rid of a lot of our you know, plastic bottle toiletries and things. And then I started volunteering with a um, local group called Groundswell Center, which provides a quarter acre for immigrant farmers, as well as classes with new farmers. But I felt like there was still something off. And I had just gotten rid of, you know, my 19 bags of clothes. And I was, I came up here, you know, new climate, new wardrobe, thinking that I would end up replacing a lot of what I got rid of that my you know, amount of clothes would stay the same. And then I watched a wonderful documentary called The True Cost, which is about fast fashion. And it sent me into a spiral of panic research. I don't know, but um, some facts on fast fashion. It's a trillion dollar industry built off the back of exploited workers. And 80 of those employed in sweatshops are women and children working under the terrible conditions. Um, ridiculously low wages and regular abuse of workers is kind of the normal thing. Um, and then also learning about the uh, Uyghur forced labor camps that are happening in the Xinjiang region of China. And studies have found that one in five cotton items that we possess were produced in that region um, where China continues to, you know, place restrictions and place Uyghur and other Turkish people into forced labor camps. And um, on the right is a collapse of a bank, uh, garment factory in Bangladesh, and below is a very restricted access uh, Uyghur labor camp in China. And then we're not, I feel like this problem is kind of invisible because those landfills aren't here, um, but 92 million tons of clothing is sent to landfill or shipped to, developing, to the developing world each year. So we're essentially exploiting the people in those countries. And then when we're done with the clothes, sending them back. In the US, people will buy an article of clothing on average every 5.5 days. So those of you who are good at math can say like, oh, that's this many <laughs> articles of clothing a year. And then get rid of 81 pounds of clothing. So I felt the personal brunt of my 19 bags of office wear that I will never ever use again going into a landfill because thrift stores can't handle everything that we send them. Um, and also it's incredibly, incredibly taxing on soils. It takes around 5,000 gallons of water to grow cotton for a single t-shirt. Um, cotton farming also uses high levels of pesticides that contribute to soil erosion. Um, the pesticides then run off into cotton fields and pollute drinking water. And then many conventional pesticides have their chemical origins in warfare, such as Agent Orange. Um, and so they are highly toxic to the farmers that work with them. And so I was wondering how have these forced labor practices become so normalized? Why does it seems like the larger Jewish world isn't really talking about this? And then if this problem is so global and so huge, how can we even begin to tackle these issues? 
Um, so the next section comes with the big disclaimer that I am a DIYist. If I can do it myself, I will do it myself. Uh, and Nate's pretty much the same way. So we started to take some small personal changes to, you know, deal with our own lifestyle. So we decided we're going to shop and we're going to want less and just enjoy our lives more. Um, we're going to purchase a lot of what we need secondhand. We're going to craft our own items, which is slightly more challenging. And then um, whatever else, like we can't find, for example, you can't buy kosher dishes secondhand. So we ended up buying our current set from like local potters. So we decided that, you know, the last resort is getting something from a tradesperson or an ethical company. Um, so this is a little backpack I made from like old recycled corduroy. And this year I resolved not to purchase any clothing. Um, and if I did need anything, I would have to sew it myself. <laughs> um, so this process taught me a lot about repurposing scraps, crafts, patience, and just you know appreciating my resources and the time that it take to, took to make something. Um, and also I felt like there was something intrinsically special about the things that I was making for myself or the things that we bought from community members. You know, it wasn't just the run of the mill <laughs> shirt that you felt like you can get rid of. You're like, oh, I put this effort in, like this is my object now. And so um, we also needed a couch. So we decided that we're gonna make our own couch. Um, that was harder than anticipated. We also haven't built a frame yet for it because we don't have any power tools. It's just another garment of clothing that I decided to make this year, a lot of long sleeves for the gold. Um, but like one person, you know, I can sit here and sew all I want to, that's just not gonna make a difference. Um, so how can we shift our own patterns of consumption to help the larger community? How do we embrace the creativity we find with like these artisan products and the things we make ourselves to reduce, you know, local and global resource problems? And then we often hear, no offense to any engineers or scientists in the room, but I always, and I actually, I work with scientists writing grants every day on um, energy efficiency, but we often hear the narrative that scientists and engineers will save the world through technological fixes. But what if arts and trades could also play a larger role in the systems thinking and community building? Um, and so this is where we kind of come to the current Parsha. And I think that by looking at the Mishkan and the way that the Mishkan was made, we can really see how um, people can come together and make something very meaningful with very limited resources. I mean, there were nomads, nomadic tribes in the desert. They didn't have a lot to work with. And actually, I think it's important to note that everything for the Mishkan, I have discovered through learning this Parsha um, was either repurposed from something that they already had or a renewable resource. It's pretty cool. So I think that, you know, we can take a look at it together and break it apart resource by resource. Oh, and we also can't go to Mishkan's or us. It's, you know, it's not a, an object that you can go to the store and buy and, you know, have a few different models for comparison. It's really an all in process. Um, so creativity, community, and craft really served to uplift B'nai Israel after a lifetime of slavery and struggles in the desert. Um, the Book of Shemot re repeats the instructions twice, I think, because they're incredibly important and they signify a turning point for B'nai Israel as, as a nation. Um, and there is a clear emphasis on voluntary participation for donors and craftspeople, as you will see too. So, um, when we go to Shmo, it says, Moses said further to the whole community of Israelites, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take, take from among you the gifts of the Lord, everyone whose heart so moves him, shall bring them gifts for the Lord, gold, silver, and copper, purple, blue, and crimson yarns, fine linen and goat's hair, tam dran skins, dolphin skins, that's an interesting translation, and acacia wood, oil for lighting spices and anointing oil for aromatic incense, and then the stones for the setting as well. So after enduring slavery, the labor for the Mishkan needed to be completely voluntary. It, every person needed to have willingly participated in it. And craftsmanship here is seen as a gift from God rather than an exploitative act. 
So when we see B'Tselel going through and organizing and working um, on the Mishkan, it's seen as something that, you know, is voluntary. It's seen as something that's beautiful. It's not seen as something that like, you know, God commanded you and you have to do this. And if you don't do this, then you will be stoned. So that's not, that's not an element here. Um, people donate, rush to donate gifts. And it's interesting, it says the men came with the women. And we'll return to that aspect of it later. Um, and then craftsmanship is just always higher quality when labor is valued and it comes from a place of love and devotion. I don't know how many of you have ever I don't know, gotten a t-shirt from Forever 21 and you see the, the zigzagging stitch kind of like going off and, you know, you can't help but feel bad, like somebody is rushing through each thing. But when you really spend time to work on an object, it shows and it lasts for a much longer time. Um, and so the first element is the precious metals. And the Torah testifies that the contributions of gold, silver, and copper for the building of the tabernacle were minuscule and valuable compared to the amount of such precious metals, which were used in the building of Solomon's temple. Again, something that, you know, they couldn't haul a lot of <laughs> in the desert. Um, and that all of these historical facts teach us a beautiful lesson that material wealth, even if donated generously, is not a major factor in the success of a temple dedicated to house the presence of God on earth. Um, we also learned that this was the gold from many of the commentaries say that this was the gold that was taken from the Egyptians before leaving the desert. If you um, remember in Shemot, they talked to their Egyptian neighbors and they're like, hey, can we borrow it? And then they just kind of left. Um, and so I think it's interesting that, you know, in Egypt, gold, silver, and copper were used to distinguish class between people. And those resources were now getting pulled and put together. Um, to emphasize the unity of the people rather than the division. Um, there's a lot of text dedicated to weaving, especially with like wool and textiles. Again, this is of great significance to people with pastoral roots. You know, if you think of your ancestors as being shepherds, I think this is, you know, and then building essentially a house for God's presence to rest in. This is one of the most wonderful ways to elevate this material. Um, and this is even carried through the Davidic kingship because you know, King David's son built the first temple. Um, and we have kind of the attributes of a shepherd rather than a despotic ruler, which is kindness, conservation, protection, and humbleness. And you know, these are seen in Tanakh in a higher light than the displays of brute power and wealth. This one I found incredibly interesting. I was not expecting to find, expecting to find this commentary when learning this Parsha. Um, and the Shittim, or the Acacia wood, where did they get this in the wilderness? Rabbi Tanfuma explains it, that our father Jacob foresaw by the gift of the Holy Spirit that Israel would once build a tabernacle in the wilderness. And he therefore brought cedars to Egypt and planted them there. And he bade his children take them with, take them, with them when they would leave Egypt. Um, so this is something that strikes very close to home. I often hear um, your generation, millennials, Gen Z will solve the problems of the world. And, you know, we feel that like being kind of, you know, slid across the table to us like a big, you know, package that says here guys, like solve hunger, solve climate change, solve this, like we're done. But, and then we also continue to say like, perhaps my children will solve this problem. But I find it inc incredibly inspiring that Yaakov was 130 years old when he entered Egypt. 130 years old. And he died shortly afterwards. Um, yet he took the time to plant the trees that were going to be used for the Mishkan. So I think that, you know, it's, I think it's time to stop thinking of like you, me, and just think of us. Like, what are we as a group going to do? Um, so there's not, I didn't find a lot about the spices, um, admittedly, but through, you know, living in Ithaca and observing the deep winters and short growing seasons, I got incredibly anxious of like, oh, if I don't find a farm to live in by March, I won't be able to plant my herbs for the coming year. I won't be able to like plant my tomatoes. So I think that including the spices in the daily rituals, meaning that this is something that they would use every day 
for their offerings um, was kind of a comforting reminder to them that, you know, just because they were now currently struck in this liminal situation of being in the desert, there would come a time when the nation would be able to continue their agricultural practices on the firm, fertile farmland of Eretz Yisrael. And I think the olive oil is also, you know, a symbol of like when the ship pulls up and you think land ho with the dove bringing the olive branch, it's also another symbol of, you know, land is coming, like we'll have a place to put down our roots. Um, no, unpopular commentary ahead. So this was probably the last commentary that came up with the stones. Um, and so it was noting that the stones that were brought for all the vestments of the temple were supposed to be brought by like the princes or the higher officials. Um, so, you know, perhaps the reason that the stones, even though they're highest in value, certainly before like spices and olive oil, they're listed last because the princes, it says in Orachayim that they hesitated to bring their contribution. And I think that this is very akin to you know, when you have a problem going on, you have like a lot of, sometimes a lot of like low middle income people that are just striking in the streets, trying to bring attention to it. And then you might have like a wealthy <laughs> individual who's like, oh, okay, like I'll, I'll donate now, you know, I'll, I'll donate. Like they don't take the lead when they're in the position of power and status where they should be taking the lead. Um, so they're saying that mentioning their contribution last was kind of like a consequence for tardiness. So always rush to do good things. Um, and then at the very end of the Parsha, before we go Chazak, Chazak would be Chazak, um, it talks about, and he set up the enclosure around the tabernacle, so all the work was done, in the altar, and put up the screen for the gate of the enclosure. When Moshe had finished the work, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the presence of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So. I think it's interesting that we now typically call this the Shekinah. So like the Shekinah of God came and rested on the around and on the tabernacle of the altar. And I kept thinking like Shekinah, Shekinah, oh. And this is frequently uh, referenced in like reform and conservative movements, um, but Shekinah is often considered like the female attribute of God. Of, like obviously God is genderless, God is, you know, has oneness, but this is something that's referred to as like the feminine attribute. And I think that it's really interesting to see that because, you know, in a lot of Tanakh, we see men being called out, men being singled out. Um, but actually in the creation of the Mishkan and the vestments, um, they talk a lot about, and every wise hearted woman spun with her hands and they brought, which they had spun blue and the purple and the scarlet and the linen. So it singles out the women, and I think that it's fascinating that the word that we use for God's presence is in Hebrew in the feminine. Um, so the takeaway is, is it may be hard to dwell in a place between where you came from and your destination, and that we can use craft and the natural resources around us to create a home even in transient situations. Um, in previous parshiot, we have a lot of you know conversation about Mamlechet Kohanim a nation of priests, like a nation of holiness, and then we get the Ten Commandments. So this really gives like a tactile close to the Book of Shmo. Um, and through mindful creativity, we can really break destructive patterns of exploitation and create a more just and equitable future for our world and communities. And that our actions can connect us to the past and improve the situations in the present, as well as transcend the mundane, maybe like some wood, some stones, you know, some yarn, it can really come together to something that can represent the community. Um, and so how can we as a culture reshape our world into a holy and intentional place? Um, so one is appreciating artisans and trades and supporting them when possible. And um, <laughs> you know, how else will we build the third temple if nobody knows how to raise sheep or knit or weave or <laughs> do woodworking. So I think that's super important for, you know, preserving our culture and also for helping people that learn trades. Um, demanding ethical practices from governments and corporations. I think it's important for people to say that no, you know, especially with Pesach coming up, I think that this is great, just writing to a brand 
that you frequently purchase from and just say like, hey, your labor and farming practices are horrible. You should really do something about that. And, you know, surprisingly, um, there have been a few case studies of this in like the lower waste community where they've gotten companies to switch their packaging. Um, Trader Joe's is a good example. They've recently had a lot of pressure to uh, reduce plastic packaging and reduce the waste of resources. So it really does work. Like if, you know, everyone took a little bit of time to do that, that would really help. Um, and then prioritize pooled resources such as free shops, lending libraries, and community creative programs. Um, I know in Europe, they are opening up a lot of lending libraries for things like tools. Um, and I know it's hard in COVID because we have, you know, we can't get together and do crafts, but, and we can't necessarily, like libraries and public places don't feel safe anymore, but hopefully with the vaccine coming out, um, this can be something that we can reignite. Um, and then also learning about systems of farming and production, like living in Montgomery County for my whole, or for the last few years and then Howard County, but you know, having most of my adult life take shape in Montgomery County, I was really removed from farming and production. So I wasn't even able to observe a lot of the issues that were happening around that. And so I'm gonna kind of close out this portion with saying um, one of my now favorite quotes from Tanakh, that he'll judge among the nations and arbitrate for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not take up sword against nation. They shall never again know work. Um, and so we hope to, God willing, purchase a farm in the coming year. And as I've been saying, you know, next year on the farm or in Jerusalem, whichever comes first. Uh, and with this, we conclude the book of Shemot, Chazak, Chazak, Benit, Chazak. Um, and this is uh, translation, one of the variants of translation, be strong, be strong, and we will strengthen one another. Um, and so here are just a few resources. If you want to learn about more about fast fashion and cotton production and renewables, um, Good On You is something that I use if I do need to buy something. They have a full rating guide that tells you, you know, where things are coming from, how their human rights practices are. Um, World Wildlife Fund is a great resource and a great place to donate to because they do a lot of work with sustainable agriculture. Um, this Manga Bay article had, you know, just some quick, it's, there's a lot of articles on this and um, this one was pretty up to date. And then truecostmovie.com, you can also see the true cost on Netflix. No, they did not sponsor me or anything. I just think that this is a great documentary um, that really you know, lays out the effects of fast fashion on climate and on human rights. And I wanna open up for questions, but I'm also working on setting up a website called themagidproject.com. And you can also email me one house. I mean, that's a smart decision to make. But Evan, you can just say, I just say, that just I, want, I want our wedding to be the best wedding of all the ones that we've been to. Cool. Uh, Hello. Was that a question or was that someone's microphone going off? All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to stop my share. So good, so good, so rich. Thank you. Irina, does anyone have any Q and A's or? Oh, well, thank you, Rain. Oh, Rain. <laughs> Hi, Rain. Irina, I figured, I thought of you with the mosaics and Deborah with the knitting the whole time that I was putting this together. <laughs> and, and I thought, is it, <laughs> shouldn't I be doing more found object mosaic based on what you're talking about rather than purchasing? Um, yeah, we have two um, Ithaca businesses. One is called the Reuse Center, and it's a local secondhand um, kind of like community thrift store. And all the resources like only come, you know, locally and they don't, you know, they don't ship anything off. Instead, they cut clothes into little pieces and they put them in the fabric bins. Great. And they do have lots of pottery and lots of glass. So. If you ever get a chance to come up here, we will definitely take a tour. <laughs> oh, yes, I, I'll be there. Yeah. Anna, what did you use to stuff the couch that you made? 
So that was um, like a dance polyfoam. Um, we actually, I was debating like, do I wait long enough to do all the scraps and stuff all the scraps? But then I researched that this foam would actually last, you know, as long, it doesn't sag. So we didn't need to, we wouldn't ever need to replace it. We essentially just, um, we would essentially just have to like, recover it once the cats scratch it up. And once um, once we move to a house, we plan to also try and build a frame for it. And that's gonna be another project, but it's definitely like, you know, Nate's very squeamish about secondhand couches. So we had to go with something that wasn't. Um, but yeah, we got all the fabrics also from a creative reuse store. And, you know, since the quality was so high, we won't need to get rid of it anytime soon. It'll just follow us forever. <laughs> Donna, hi. Uh, this is hi, everyone. Barbara. Hi. So all the things that you're doing, did you kind of teach yourself? I mean, you're very creative to begin with, but teaching yourself all these things, or did you, you know, look online or take classes? Or how did you well, move to where yeah. you are now? <laughs> Um, so my mom was an avid, so is an avid seamstress. So she did a lot of sewing with me when I was a kid. Um, that's where I learned like the pattern making element of it. I had no idea how to use a sewing machine literally up until this year. And I just kind of had to get the most basic one. Thank you to Nate's parents who are still here for my Hanukkah gift. <laughs> um, and I just had to like watch a million YouTube tutorials on how to, I still jam it. It's not, you know, it's by no means perfect, but yeah, that, that was a lot of that. I think also going to architecture school helped, um, you know, getting into that first studio and they ask you the question, like, what is even a building? And so you feel really empowered to take <laughs> things apart and then put them back together in ways that work for you. And I assume like even, when you get into eventually growing and farming and things, those are things you'll be learning or bartering with others and learning how to do things. Like that. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I, I'm volunteering with Groundswell. Um, you know, I'm doing development, but I think eventually I will be taking courses with them. Um, I'm also very blessed to be married to Nate, who knows a lot about plants and you know, worked in landscaping and did all that wonderful stuff. So at least, at least I know the plants won't die. Um, we have two cats. I've always had animals. Um, I grew up riding horses and all that stuff. So that's kind of a natural, <laughs> that's more of my forte. So I, I just think that like, if anyone is inspired enough to do anything, then you can just try it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing stopping you. Like, Right. You don't necessarily have to be in that career. Just go for it and ask people for help along the way. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Anna. Thank you. Hanna, could you post your slideshow in the chat so that people like have access to the links you put together and the other useful information that you're very timely in Torah and all that? Sure. Thank and you. then I'm going to also be posting on the website I set up. Um, play more. Can I, can I ask sure. another question about clothing? Sure. Yeah. So this is something I think about. I feel like it's a bit chicken egg because I feel like most clothing made these days just doesn't stay good for that long. Um, and so that you end up buying more of it. And so I'm just curious, like, what you find the average, you know, shelf life of let's say a shirt is if you, do you wash them in a certain way so that they don't fall apart as fast, et cetera? Yeah. So that's a really interesting point. Um, when we lived in DC, our old apartments always had dryers. Um, so we were using dryers a lot and I would just throw everything in one load and then Nate would be like, I want to de disinfect and turn it up to hot. Um, and Mike is asking about access, I will definitely do that so you can get into it. But um, yeah, so it, it is a big problem. Clothing is becoming more and more designed for the garbage can essentially. 
Um, it's harder to find quality pieces. I do think the good on you um, link is, you know, really helpful. I have, before I decided to do the no buy this year, I bought some like leggings and shirts from a few of those places that I'm still using. And they are lasting longer than a lot of the, you know, clothing I was getting from Target and Forever 21 was. Um, and another thing is like, shopping at thrift stores, a lot of the time you can find older pieces that have a lot of really great quality. Uh, and even when you go to Joann's, I was shocked, like, because I thought that all sewing people got their fabric from Joann, but I was shocked when I went, it was actually super thin and um, wore off really fast. So if you look at a garment and it kind of has like a nice thickness to it, it's likely it'll last longer. And also, so learning a little bit about like if there's a polyester content, it's less likely to shrink. If it's cotton, it'll shrink a few sizes was also really helpful. But in in short, yes, clothing is getting a lot worse. And I think that, you know, through writing to brands, we can ask them about sustainability, but we can also be like, hey, why is your quality terrible? Like this looks cute, but it fell apart in two days. It's interesting that it says it says in the Torah that through the through the years in the desert the people's clothes never wore out. That's interesting. So they they, they, they there's forty work. years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's actually um there's traditions in Japan. One of them is called sashiko, and that's actually where they take a garment and they patch it continuously forever and ever and ever. And there are uh, younger Japanese people that have like three hundred year old jackets. Um. So yeah. yeah. There's a really nice Sashiko Facebook page where you can get a lot of help and how to, about how to mend things and stuff. And I, I personally buy things from mostly L.L. Bean and I've had turtlenecks from them. I have some for 25 years now. Yeah, yeah. I have definitely. another sweater that's 40 years old because I never put them in the dryer. Yeah, and Atara sent, uh, Atara sent a link um, threadup.com. It's a used clothing site. And you can actually search um, by brand there. Um, so once I am done with my no buy and I, you know, I've had a falling out with my sewing machine or something, <laughs> um, that's probably what I'm going to turn to just because it's so searchable. I just got rid of my bell bottoms a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And fashion always comes back around, just like wait it out, <laughs> it'll come back. And I think it's a little different to um, something that moving has taught me. I used to think that like appearance was a lot more important and I worked in an office and if any of you ever visit Ithaca, it's kind of like just wear the sandals and the jeans every day. <laughs> so that's helped with getting my wardrobe down to like essentials and then keeping those up for many years. I'm wondering if this year will have an impact on the way we dress for shul or weddings or occasions. Um, I, I hope mean so. just dressing from the waist up, I mean in general. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. I definitely feel like this is a much, much bigger topic, but I think it also crosses into the realm of like body positivity. You know, when you have so much less in your less used to seeing yourself in like 20 different lights you know is that going to increase your acceptance of yourself or your overall happiness i've definitely found not, not shopping to like save me so much time and so much like stress and pain of just trying things on the dressing room and you know so i, I think it will change i think mike has something to say too and that yeah um so do you find that the community up near where you live, there are more people that are like-minded in terms of being, you know, the same philosophy that you're, um, that you've been expressing here? I certainly, I think Ohev will always be my like spiritual community. I definitely find Ithaca versus DC to be my like philosophical community. Um, but you know, with a lot of things, this has kind of been a testing ground. Um, the mayor is very progressive. The people are very prone to organizing. So, you know, we've had things like municipal composting for a much longer time, and that's actually now being introduced all over the country. 
Um, and I think it's also good to see here that like people, you know, people ask the government and people ask each other for these programs and then somehow they tend to happen more quickly. Whereas in, you know, other larger cities, things are more established. So it's harder to move within those systems. Um, and there's just a lot of farms. So a lot of farm people, farm philosophies, <laughs> um, you know, lower population density is definitely more conducive to the relaxed environment. But, yeah. And this very nice pillow that you made for us, <laughs> does that have, Aww. does that, thank you. Does it have the, the same memory foam as in your, in your couch? No, no, that one is small enough. I was able to stuff with um, fabric scraps entirely. Oh my goodness. Awesome. Yeah, well, we, so, we treasure it. Thank you. It's, yeah, just don't tell Disney about the show. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're getting close to our time. Does anyone have any more questions or? Well, I just want to say that knowing you, um, the combination of, of love of Torah, love of a good, conversation argument with god love of taking things on taking things on and love of you and nate together you are remarkable people and i'm very lucky to know you and to god willing visit you and come to your bed and breakfast but i think i would really watch a podcast of the life of Hannah and Nate. Oh, that's so sweet. I am really trying hard to uh, get a blog going because uh -huh. I am, you know, this takes a lot more. Speaking comes a lot less naturally to me since English is one of the three languages that was crammed into my brain super early. <laughs> but that will be in written form, so it'll be probably more cohesive okay. um, and well thought through. I would like to would like for Nate to do a podcast because he has a great radio voice. Oh, that's true. Nate, you'll have, you'll have an episode when you find bulk herring, and I have to buy it in a jar. <laughs> <laughs> we did we did buy bulk apples this fall, and we pulled up to the farm, and the woman's like, "You didn't know how much you ordered." <laughs> Like, you know that this is like three packs. I'm like, oh, I know this is gonna last all winter. So. And did they? Um. All, yeah, I think we just had like the last one into a pie last week. Wow. Um. Yeah, and our our next big zero waste, low waste, low impact, whatever you want to call it, challenge is a uh, Pesach. Yeah. Mm. So we're trying to navigate how we're going to do that without single use plastics. Um, what the halacha of like having a compost bin is. So like once it's rotting in your compost, like is it chametz, is it not? Do we have to drop off compost before Chag starts? Like before Mahara came back just in time. <laughs> yeah, Hilchos compost. <laughs> I just started composting, so now I feel like I can eat grapefruit without feeling guilty. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, once it's gross, once it's not edible, it's not food anymore, but this is a longer. If you can figure out the Shabbos leading into Pesach without any single use plastics or anything, I will be very impressed. So we do use um, like paper and newspaper sometimes because those can be ripped up into little pieces and put in composting. Uh, so that's giving me a little bit of hope. Um, <laughs> just eat with your finger, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's just such a holiday where we're just taught to go out and buy so many things all the time that it's, you know, what are we gonna do without our chocolate spread or but I you know the, the <laughs> strategy is going to be getting a Pesach blender and like using that to make a whole bunch of like soups and cauliflower crusts and hopefully that'll that'll get us through it's only a week too I keep reminding myself like I don't have to go all out potatoes we used to eat potatoes and matzah and that was it the song we still eat like potatoes. this, this one. 
Bokez, <laughs> it's a Yiddish song. Go ahead, Pesha. Sing it. Moontik, Bulbis, Deanstick, Bulbis. I, I'm not going <laughs> to afflict you for the rest of the week. <laughs> Bulbis. Catchy <laughs> little song. All right. And then Shabbos is however you say potato fugle is amazing. Yeah. It's the greatest song. Fugle bulbous. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. This was so much fun. It was fun. It was great. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for coming. I hope all the people all come you. to to your farm and we'll all come at the same time and have a retreat. <laughs> that sounds so fun. Trade I think clothes. Uh, what was that? And trade clothes. Yes. So we can all go home and sleep in the underwear. Okay. Right. <laughs> All right. Bye good bye night. Everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.